My name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OCRB Salters uh, Modern Analytical Techniques and this uh, covers or this is covered under the Polymers and Life topic so PL. So this video is dedicated to OCRB Salters so if you are studying Salters then this video is perfect for you. Um, it's not generic um, it doesn't have any information in there which you don't need to know. In fact, it's tailored to OCR Salters. And in fact, there's a full range of OCRB Salters videos uh, on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. So um, there's uh, year one and year two. So these are all the black videos, these ones here, which are revision videos. And I've also done whiteboard tutorials as well, looking at specific, they're generic, but they look at specific parts of chemistry. So if you're looking for information on, say, titrations or anything like that, then go and have a look at the, the whiteboard uh, tutorials on there. And um, they're all for free. So all I ask is you hit the subscribe button. That'll be absolutely fantastic. And basically, if people keep subscribing and watching, then I will keep making the videos. So it's as simple as that. And um, these videos as well, um, I've also made from, um, so I've made these from um, slides, so PowerPoint slides, uh, and they're designed for revision. So if you'd like your own copy of them, you can purchase them from the test shop, from my test shop, and if you just click on the link in the description box, you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Um, they're great value for money. You can use them on your tablet, your smartphone, um, use them you know, as and when you as and when you need. And also, um, I've known some people to print these off as well and use them as to supplement their revision notes. And like I say, there is a full range of um, as a full range of uh, videos. Um, uh, full range of videos is a full range of. Uh, uh, slide decks as well for every topic uh, for OCR solids, so it's perfect for that. So go and have a look there. Go and have a go and have a quick look. Like I said, there's loads on Allery Chemistry as well. So um, just go and go and have an explore. Right, like I say, this is dedicated to OCRB salters, as you can see, and so it meets these specification points. Now, there's um, quite a lot of detail. There's not a lot of specification points here, but there's a lot of detail that's required. So basically, we're going to have a look at mass spectra at first. We're going to look at the M plus peak. We're then going to look at um, some of the um, uh, mass spectra unique uh, differences, the gaps. So when we're looking at uh, fragmentation patterns, so we're looking at that as well in mass spectra. We then move swiftly on to uh, NMR, so nuclear magnetic resonance, and then we look at finally towards the end, we're looking at the um, uh, spectroscopic technique. So using all of the spectroscopy that you would have um, seen in OCR Salters, we're going to use all of that, and we're going to put that into in some use towards the end as well. So there's quite a bit in this video, so let's make a start. So we're going to start with mass spectrometry, like I said first. And so mass spectrometry um, is used to find the relative molecular mass or MR of a compound. So it's really useful for that. And you can see we've got an example of a graph here that has various peaks. And this shows um, obviously the relative abundance of each peak in a, in a mass spectrometry. Okay, so let's have a look. So MZ, which is the bit at the bottom, MZ is just the mass of a fragment. So when we when we take a sample, we basically push it through a mass spectrometer and it breaks it up into loads of different fragments of that molecule. Um, and the masses of each of them is 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 weighed basically. So um, we call that a mass to charge ratio. Now most of the fragments that go through have a charge of plus one. So basically the MZ value on here for most of the time is actually the um, the mass of the fragment or molecule that we're that we're testing. So um, this is the MZ value, basically M over Z. So Z meaning charge. Okay. So you can see here that we have, um, like I said, the peaks show fragments of the original molecule, but the last significant peak, not not always the very last one, but the last significant peak in here, which is the one that's pointed to there in the yellow. Um, is the molecular iron peak, or also known as the M plus peak. And so this is the same as the relative molecular mass of the molecule. Okay, so it's exactly the same. So um, whatever this is, this one's, for example, is 50. So whatever this molecule is, has a molecular mass of 50. So there's also, you may also see some of the smaller peaks as well. So the one just to the right of that called an M plus one peak. So, um, so this is... Um, generally caused by isotopes. So a classic example would be carbon. So carbon normally has um, a mass of 
12, so its relative atomic mass is 12, um, but you do have isotopes of carbon-13 as well. So some of the molecules with carbon-13 isotopes will show a slightly smaller peak, just slightly to the right of the M-plus peak, and we call that M-plus-1. And again, there might be um, an M-plus-2 peak as well, um, and we'll look at some of these as well in terms of the... Um, uh, some of the patterns in mass spectrometry where we look at th particular things like halogens such as bromine and chlorine but you can see here um, chlorine actually has two stable isotopes so if this compound did contain chlorine you would also see an M plus 2 peak because chlorine has um, a higher abundance of ma mass of 35 but it does have some chlorine 37 so we see M plus 2 peaks as well to show these types of isotopes. Okay, so we're going to look, at. obviously we've seen um, what a mass spectrometer or what mass, uh, mass spectrum looks like. And we know we get M plus 1 peaks, M plus peaks and M plus 2 peaks. We get different types of peaks depending on the isotopes. So what we're going to look at, you can see there's various other peaks before that as well. And we're going to explore that area of the um, spectrum as well. So this time we're going to be looking at something called fragmentation. And basically, this is what I said uh, just before, is that when we inject our sample into our mass spectrometer, and um, what happens is they're bombarded with high energy electrons, um, and basically they break up, the, the, the long molecule breaks up into smaller pieces, and we call that fragmentation. And this can be quite useful, actually, because we can then use that to determine um, molecular structure, so basically what actually forms part of our molecule. It's very important, as you'll see later on, that we don't just use mass spectrometry on its own. We integrate it with, say, infrared, NMR as well, um, and we integrate it with, um, say, chromatography, um, so gas chromatography, for example, HPLC. So loads of different techniques to actually identify a substance. So mass spectrometry is just one part of that mix. So let's have a look. So we've got propane fragments here, okay? So propane, propane has three carbons. Um, now, propane fragments, um, uh, or the fragmentation of propane, produces a positive fragment and a radical. And only the positive charge, or the positively charged fragment, is actually detected in the mass spectrometer. Okay, the radical isn't. So let's have a look and see how this is split. So a molecular iron peak produced in the spectrum is this. Okay, so this is the m plus peak which is this here so basically we have a positive charge here and this is detected by the mass spectrum okay so this spectrum will produce three major peaks okay so let's have a look so you've got this obviously your main peak which is this one we also form our ch3 plus so it can break to form this and this so that's the fragmentation and it can also break the other way to form that so the peaks that we see are the ones in red. So there we are. So we get three major peaks from this um, from this molecule here. So let's see how this translates into the spectrum. So here it is here. So you can see we've got our masses of our different fragments that could be formed from this. So we've got a, a fragment at 44, which is our M plus peak. So that's the one in the far right there. That's this one here. And then we've got a middle peak, which is CH3, CH2 plus, which has got a mass of 29. And then a mass of 15, which is CH3 plus, which is on this side. So you can see here, these are the this, these are the, um, example of some of the fragments that are produced from propane. Okay, so the smaller peaks, um, there are some smaller peaks as well in this. These have been emitted uh, from the spectrum, but you you will be able to see them if you actually had a proper spectrum in front of you. You might see loads of little peaks. So um, so what I've done is I've emitted these just for simplicity. Um, what, I'm also, what I should also remember with this, with fragmentation, is you're looking for specific values here and you'll you'll get used to them so for example a ch3 plus as an mr15 you'll get used to it. a peak at 15 is likely to be a ch3 plus a one at 17 is uh sorry a peak at 17 is likely to be an oh plus so this is something like an alcohol for example um a one at 28 is a classic sign of a carbonyl group so a c double bond or so you're looking for particular fragments and looking at the masses and just think about okay so what common chunks of an organic molecule could cause these peaks here and that gives you a little bit of idea of the type of um, molecules that may be in there and their structures so just continuing on with fragmentation obviously um, 
they are obviously all fragmented and broken up but these fragmentation we can get what we call fragmentation patterns and these can be used to identify molecules with the same constituent atoms and this is because um, the fragment masses will be actually slightly different so let's have a look here so you can see here we've got propanal and propanone both have the same types of carbons and oxygens and hydrogens, same number of um, same molecular mass, but obviously structured differently. One's an aldehyde and one's a ketone. So let's have a look at the data. So you can see here some major propanal fragments are things like this here. So obviously that's the M plus peak, and then you've got a CH3, CH2 fragment that can break off, which is this bit here, and the COH fragment as well, because this can break at this point, leaving this fragment. So if we look and compare that with some major propanone fragment, fragments, we were more likely to get a CH3 fragment because these can break at these points here. We're likely to get a CH3CO as well. So this can break off this bit here. Okay. And we're also um, likely to get obviously our M plus peak as well there. So you can see the different types of fragments that are formed with these types of molecules. And this obviously can be used to distinguish between propanal and propanone. So we can even identify our unknown compound by comparing them against the library of known spectra. So we can take our spectra that we've just generated and compare it against the known set. So for example, if it's a chemical that's been seen before, and we can actually positively identify it through that way as well. But obviously in this example, you're mainly going to be looking at, um, you know, how you can identify fragments that can be produced from these two molecules. And you're just looking for break points, mainly between carbon and carbon. These are where your break points are going to be. Okay, so just continuing on with fragmentation, because there's quite a bit of information you can get from mass spectrometry, like I say. But what we can do is we can look at the difference between peaks in a mass spectrum and what this does is it tells us about the fragments um, that um, so it tells us about the fragments that may not actually show up on the chart in other words they won't actually break individually but we can look at differences and that can tell us a little bit about what we have in our molecule as well so this is really similar to the technique you've seen before so we need to know about the masses of these individual fragments so remember when i was saying about a ch3 plus fragment and oh plus fragment so the masses of these are going to be important this is where knowing the masses of these fragments kind of gives you a bit of an upper hand because you can use these masses and look for differences in the peak values to identify molecules that may not have their own peak on the actual um, spectrum so Let's have a look. So you can see here in this chart, we can see the results of a simplified spectrum. So I've moved some of the smaller peaks from this of propanone. Okay. So there's a difference between two of the peaks. So I've just isolated all of them and just put these two peaks in. And there's a difference of 29. So can you have a think about which fragment has been lost? So have a think. <coughs> okay. Excuse me. Okay, so the fragment that's been lost here is um, a mass of 29 coincides with the loss of an ethyl radical, of an ethyl group here, so an ethyl radical. So um, this equation actually shows it. So you can see here we've got our M plus uh, 44, which is here. Okay, and we're going to form an ethyl radical and our CH3 plus. So obviously MZ15 is going to be your CH3 plus. So what's broken off here is your CH3, CH2. That's a classic sign. The difference is saying what radical is actually formed, is actually being broken off. But remember, your mass spectrometer only detects positive ions. So this isn't detected, but it's shown as, obviously, because this isn't this doesn't actually appear on the spectrum, as you can see here, because it's a radical. But um, we can actually confirm it's that because we can spot differences in the mass values. Okay, so that's basically what we mean when we're saying spotting the difference between the, um, the, the different peaks. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that example and we're going to actually use it in a real spectrum as you can see here. So there are times, like I say, when fragments don't form stable positive charges. And so this doesn't form a peak on the mass spectrum. So that's another example, for example, where you might have a halogen that doesn't actually form a positive charge, a stable positive charge. So it'll never have its own peak on the actual spectrum so looking for these differences in peak values is really valuable because it provides us with evidence of the missing peaks so let's have a look here so notice you can see we've got the mass spectrum for chlorobenzene in this example here and we have two peaks we have one at mz112 which is this one here 
okay? And we have one which has got MZ114, which is your M plus two peak, which is down here, which is this one, okay? So chlorine, we know chlorine has two isotopes. You've got isotopes chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. Their abundances are 75 to 25. And actually we can see here that this peak at 112, this one is three times as big as the one of 114. So what it means is this M plus peak, um, uh, the M plus peak is 112, so this means that the 114 one is the M plus 2 peak, and this is a really classic sign of a chlorine. You need to be able to remember the structure, the basic kind of patination for chlorine. Chlorine has this classic 3 to 1 ratio, and the 3 to 1 ratio is always two units apart. So you've got M plus and M plus 2, and that signifies a chlorine. Um, 35 and 37 okay so that's a, a strict pattern you need to be able to identify that three to seven uh, three to one ratio and so from this what we'd expect to see is a significant peak at 35 and 37 to show a cl plus isotope fragments which that break away from that benzene but you can see on this graph they're missing there's not one there so there's 35 there there isn't a peak there and there's a tiny little one uh well there's nothing there for 37, there's a tiny little one there. So they're not significant enough to suggest that these isotopes exist. So this proves that actually chlorine plus isotopes um, really don't uh, are not actually formed here. But we can have evidence of them by looking at the, the patterns that we can see there. So you can see the peak at 77 though is a phenyl ion. So that will show. So if we break that chlorine off, what we're left with is a phenyl ion, which is C6H5+. However, if we look at the difference between the M plus peak, which is 112, um, and the MZ of, and the MZ of 77, we get 35. And this also proves the loss of a chlorine. So we can really distinguish that. We can say, right, that loss of 35 is proof that we did have a chlorine attached to this molecule. If we break that chlorine off, it'll come off as a radical and it won't be detected by the mass spectrometer. But the remaining fragment, which is the phenyl ion, C6H5+, is evident here. And you can see we've got a loss of 35. That definitely tells us we have a loss of a chlorine atom. Okay, so we're looking for these patterns, as you can see, but the chlorine one you really do need to be familiar with. Okay, so this is mass spectrometry, looking at a standard resolution, but we can also have high-resolution mass spectrometry as well. And high-resolution mass spectrometry is really useful when we're trying to identify molecules with the same molecular mass, okay, rounded to the nearest whole number. So, for example, you might have two molecules, both with a molecular mass of 40, but they might be different molecules. In other words, they're, um, you know, the, the atoms that make them up are different. Now, to a standard resolution mass spectrometer, it can't tell the difference. It looks at it and says, well, they've both got a mass of 40. High resolution mass spec can actually distinguish to a really high level uh, degree of precision what, um, you know, what their molecules would be. So let's have a look at an example. So high resolution mass spectrometers, they measure relative masses to a few decimal places, okay, like the standard one, which you will have seen just before, okay. So they may only be able to measure relative masses to a whole number, which you've seen the numbers on there. It's 35, 36, 37, etc. It doesn't show the exact detailed mass. So let's have a look. So ethanol and propane, okay, they both have an MR of 44 to the nearest whole number. So if we look at the atomic mass data, we can see um, that carbon has a mass of 12, H or hydrogen has a mass of 1.0078, and oxygen is 15.9990. So these are the exact masses to four decimal places. And actually by using this data here, we can then add up the, the exact mass of each of these molecules. So here it is here. So you can see the MR of our ethanol here is 44.0302, so we're using this data here, and the mass of uh, propane, as you can see here, is 44.0624. So both, you see, both would show in a standard resolution of a mass of 44, but using high resolution mass spectrometry, we could see that we can clearly distinguish between these two molecules and can obviously use this high resolution, this high level of precision to actually work this out. 
So this is all you need to know for high resolution mass spectrometry. Um, all you need to know for mass spectrometry, should I say. So you'd say, just looking at that bit, you need to know what mass spectrum is, what it looks like, what an M plus, M plus one, and M plus two peaks are. You need to know for differences, so pattern, so patination, for example, your chlorine, and you need to understand what the advantages are of high resolution mass spectrometry and using the um, numbers there. Um, to work out um, or distinguish between two molecules of the same molecular mass. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at another type of spectroscopy, which is NMR. Okay, so NMR, which is Nuclear Magnetic Resonance Spectroscopy, and it's used to help determine the structure of a molecule. Now, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, as the name suggests, um, um, is looking at using magnets and we're looking at the nucleus of an atom um, and resonance because we're looking at um, feedback of um, radio waves which we're going to look at in a moment now you might have seen these in hospitals they use these in hospitals in fact but they call them MRI scanners so magnetic resonance imaging now the reason why is a bit of a fun fact here but um, the reason why and um, they call it MRI and not NMR is because um, it's believed that the word nuclear in NMR actually um, puts people off from attending some of these scans because they think they're going to be radiated with some kind of um, powerful radiation, um, which is which is not the case with MRI. MRI, um, uh, which is not the case with NMR because it doesn't actually use any form of radiation, as you'll see soon. Um, so that's why they call it MRI, and obviously it comes out with an image as well. But they chop the bit nuclear bit off, so it's a bit softer for people to. Uh, um, not going to be worried about being radiated with something but obviously it's the same type of equipment and um, it just produces an image at the other side um, but the actual technology is the same and you'll see it here so there's no difference but they've changed the name of it okay so let's have a look so NMR can be really tough um, if you've seen it already if you've gone through it in school or college or you've looked through it yourself independently if you're an independent learner then um you'll find that NMR can be really, really hard. It's not it's not straightforward at all. So what we're going to do, what I'm, my aim is to try and simplify it as much as I can and talk through how NMR works, especially if you're just new to it. Um, then I'll try and simplify it as much as I can. Um, the, first, the best way in which I could do this is by going through um, is going through how that works first. And I'll break it down as much as I can. Then once we've got an appreciation for actually how NMR works, we can then apply it to, um, you know, some spectra and we can start and look and analyze that. OK, so let's start with um, what NMR is. Well, what NMR types there are first. So we've got two types that you need to know. Salters want you to know about carbon 13 NMR. So this is where you've got where we're looking at about how carbon atoms are arranged and high resolution proton NMR tells us how hydrogen atoms are arranged. Now, the really unique thing about NMR is it really does tell us about the structure of the molecule. It's a really powerful analytical tool um, and it's really useful for telling us about how molecules are actually built up. So how it works is if you've got an atomic nucleus. Um, so NMR only works with odd numbered nucleons. So for example, carbon 13 has an odd number of nucleons. So this tells the number of protons and neutrons in there. So there's 13. And obviously protons only have one. So that's an odd number. Now, if you have a uh, an atom with an odd number of nucleons in there, then what they have is they have a nuclear spin. So they all spin in a particular direction, as you can see in that diagram there. Okay. So the nuclear spin creates a weak magnetic field around this, around the um, nu around the nucleus, and NMR is basically detecting how uh, NMR detects how these magnetic fields are affected by a larger external magnetic field. So here's the first word is nuclear because we're looking at nucleus of an atom. Okay, so there's nothing nuclear about it really. Magnetic, as you can see, we're going to have an external magnetic field, and you're going to see how that's impacted. So hydrogen has one proton and so it does have a nuclear spin. Now you might think, well, hang on, carbon's got six protons and six neutrons, so that's 12, which is fine. Now NMR does not detect carbon 12, but 1% of carbon atoms in a molecule will be carbon 13 and NMR will detect carbon 13. That has seven neutrons and six protons, so has a total of 13, so does have nuclear spin. So NMR will only detect odd-numbered nuclei. Anything that's even, it will not detect. Okay, 
that's going to be quite important when we look at it later on in terms of solvents. Okay, so we'll look at that later. Okay, so the nuclei, the nuclei, these spin in random directions. Okay, so they're spinning in loads of different orientations in either clockwise or anticlockwise. But when we apply an external magnetic field, these nuclei then align. They either align with the magnetic field or they align against the magnetic field. Okay, so NMR is, is pretty much going to look at um, look at these here. So nuclei, as you can see here, they're spinning in uh, random directions here. So when there's no external magnetic field that's applied, the nuclei are pretty much spinning in whatever direction they want. But the moment I apply an external magnetic field, you can see there with these arrows, this is what NMR machine does, the nuclei then either align with the magnetic field at the bottom or against it at the top, as you can see there. Now you'll notice that um, the ones that spin against it have a higher energy level, okay? So they have more energy and they're at the top there. The ones at the bottom have less energy and they spin with the external magnetic field, okay? Now, what happens is NMR is actually firing out. So it applies this external magnetic field. So it's got them arranged in that particular way. And then it fires out radio waves. So this is like the resonance bit, okay? So at, at a specific frequency, the, nu uh, the specific frequency the nuclei are aligned with, the magnetic field absorb the energy and flip up to a higher energy level. So depending on sort of very specific frequency, the energy from these nuclei here um, these nucleon absorb this energy, it flips up to a higher energy level, okay, and actually starts to orientate, well, orientates in the opposite direction because it's been hit with these radio waves, okay. So those with higher energy can also drop to a lower energy, and what they do is they emit the energy that they've just absorbed. So um, to promote one of these up to the higher level, then energy is required, um, and it knocks the spin the opposite way, and these ones can then come back down here. Now, what you've got to remember is, um, if you've seen on the other videos, you'll know that I use this kind of um, this phrase where I say that atoms and molecules and nucleons and protons, etc., they're all incredibly lazy. Okay, they want to be in the lowest energy level possible. So you'll find that most of the nuclei will align with the magnetic field because it's the most, it's the lowest energy. Some will align against it, and um, but the vast majority will align with the magnetic field. And so because of this, because there's more nuclei aligned with this magnetic field because it's lower in energy, then more energy is actually absorbed than is emitted. Okay, and so what NMR is doing is it's measuring the amount of energy that's been absorbed by these nucleons to spin in the opposite direction. Okay, so you're following so far. <laughs> okay, so this is basically what NMR is doing. So it's applying the magnetic field and it's applying uh, infrared radiation as well. Okay, so the energy absorbed by a nuclei is dependent upon the environment that it's in. Okay, this is really, really, really important. NMR is just as much as about, well, it's actually quite a lot about um, what's next door to the carbon atom or hydrogen atom rather than the actual carbon or hydrogen that's been looked at. So it's very much about what's neighboring it, and that has an influence, okay? I'm going to use an analogy in a moment, so be warned. So a nucleus can be shielded from an external magnetic field from electrons surrounding the nucleus okay so imagine if i'm gonna uh let's say i'm gonna push you down a hill and that hill's got loads of rocks sticking out of it now let's imagine i put i push you down and you're gonna feel every bump through your clothing okay you're gonna feel every bump all the way down it's gonna hurt isn't it now let's imagine i'm gonna do exactly the same but i'm gonna wrap you in bubble wrap i'm gonna put a thick layer of bubble wrap around and i'm gonna push you down the hill again okay um, now, what's going to happen is you're not going to feel them bumps as much because you're protected or shielded by that bubble wrap, okay? So you're going to get down the bottom and you're going to be unscathed effectively. So if you've got a nice cushion, um, a nice cushion, um, you know, around you, then you're going to be protected from external factors such as the rocks. It's exactly the same for NMR, except instead of the bubble wrap, we've got electrons which protect the nucleus in the middle. Um, and the external magnetic field instead of rocks is actually the external magnetic field here, so the external factor. So um, the nucleus can be shielded with electrons surrounding the nucleus. Okay, so the more electrons it's got, the more shielding there is. 
Um, now, an atoms or groups of atoms that are adjacent to the nucleus affect the level of shielding. So, for example, electronegative elements such as oxygen and chlorine and nitrogen, these can pull electrons away from that atom. So, it might be a carbon atom, for example, and that effectively reduces the shielding. So, that's like me pulling some of that bubble wrap away and giving you some bubble wrap, but not a lot. So, then you can be affected a little bit more by the rocks as you go down the hill. So, NMR is, is similar, except the... Um, the electronegative element like chlorine is pulling some of the electrons away. It's leaving that carbon atom a little bit exposed, a little bit more susceptible to the external magnetic field. And that's going to have an influence on on um, where that peak, if we look at a spectrum, where that peak's going to sit. It's going to shift further up. We'll look at chemical shift as well later. Okay. So, basically, the magnetic field will be felt by the nuclei differently depending on the environment it is in as they absorb different amounts of energy at the various frequencies that are around. Um, and this is the difference, and the difference between that energy gap that I showed you before, between nuclei spinning with the magnetic field and spinning against the magnetic field. So that difference is what NMR spectroscopy picks up. Okay? So, the environment is determined by the groups of atoms that exist near to the nuclei being examined. So we look along the full chain, not just the atoms immediately bonded to the atom that's being examined, okay? So I'm going to use an analogy here, okay? And it's a bit like, so I live in a, a, a street and it's got look, a few houses down, down the street. So imagine, so get your imagination working here. So you're in a street and you've got a house, uh, you're at a house in a street, okay? Now, um, some of the houses along here, they have hedges. They have hedges at the front. Okay, now what I notice here, because I'm a little bit boring, um, but what I notice here is that one person, when one person starts to cut the hedge, you find that the neighbour gets an idea and says, "Oh, I'm going to cut mine as well," um, and they kind of copy each other. So the neighbours are influencing each other. Okay, so one neighbour cuts the hedge, and next door will then be influenced by what they're doing, and they'll cut their hedge as well, and then that carries on all the way down the street, and they'll keep cutting their hedge because they're influenced by. The original house at the front and you know vice versa so i might cut my hedge first and i notice that everybody else within the week starts cutting their hedge as well now i like to think it's because i'm influencing them i don't i don't know it might be just they might be independently thinking that but never mind it's a nice analogy to use okay so nmr is very similar so we've got a imagine the carbon atom is like a house depending on what's next door to that will depend on what that uh, you know how much influence each each atom has now what we need to do is look all the way down the bottom of the street and all the way to the top of the street so we're looking right across for this influence so the house right at the bottom of my street will be less influenced by me cutting my hedge than the person next door okay but nonetheless there will still be an influence because they could probably see the house okay so it's the same with nmr spectroscopy okay so let's imagine if we have um so if i bring up this last point and then I'll, I'll go through a, a similar type of analogy but for an atom to be in the same environment here it must be bonded to an atom or groups of atoms that are identical okay I'm going to look at some examples in the next slide as well of what we mean but let's say imagine if we had three houses okay and they're, they're right next door to each other so you've got a middle house and you've got the two end houses and at the end of the end houses you've got fields both of them have got green fields either side so my house let's say i live in the middle okay so when i look right i see a house when i look left i see a house yeah so that's my surroundings for the end house okay when they look right they see a field and when they look left they see my house so the other end house when they look left they see a field and when they look right they see my house so both the end houses are looking into my house and they're looking into a field so they both have the same kind of environment Whereas me, stuck in the middle, I don't have a field either side. I'm looking onto both of these houses either side. So there's I'm in one environment, so I'm looking at two houses, and the people in the end are looking at my house and a field. Okay, so they're both looking at the same things. So we say that in that scenario, we have two different environments. We have my house in the middle, and we have the two end ones who have both got the benefit of looking at a field and my house. Okay, so keep that analogy in your head and we're going to apply that to chemistry okay so careful <laughs> um okay so let's have a look so we've got a range of examples here and we're going to look at different environments so we're going to look at carbon environments and we're going to look at hydrogen environments 
So let's have a look at this one here. So here there are two carbon environments. We've got the purple, see we've got the purple carbon. So just imagine it's a little bit like houses. We've got the house in the middle, okay? Um, and then you've got the houses either side. So these ones are both bonded to the same carbon or the house in the middle. Um, and they've got green fields either side. So this one is one environment, this carbon here. And this one, these two, are in the same environment. So NMR will detect two environments in this molecule, not three, because these two carbons are the same. Okay, so you're basically looking for symmetry. Okay, let's have a look at the one. So this one is, all I've done is I've moved that bromine from the middle to the end, and it makes a big difference for NMR. So you can see here that we've now got three separate environments. So we've got this one here, which is bonded to the bromine directly. This bromine is going to pull electrons away from this carbon. Okay. Then this one here is bonded to a CH2, then a bromine. And this one here is bonded to a CH2, a CH2, and a bromine. So each one of these are in different environments. Okay. There's no symmetry there. So therefore, NMR will detect three separate environments. Okay, so let's look at it in terms of hydrogen environments. So we're looking at hydrogens here. So we can see, um, looking at a, um, another halo, halo alkane or halogen or alkane, these hydrogens are in one environment. These are in a different environment here. So these ones are on the end. Uh, these ones are closer to the bromine. So there's two different environments there. And then finally, if we just tweak that a bit, and we're going to put two bromines on either side. We now have symmetry here. So all of these hydrogens, as you can see there, are all in the same environment. They're both bonded. So these hydrogens here are bonded to a bromine, and then a carbon, a CH2, and a bromine. These, This one here is bonded to a bromine, and it's bonded to a CH2 and a bromine. So they're both equidistant away from these electronegative elements here. So there's an element of symmetry there. So we have one hydrogen environment and there's four hydrogens in that environment. Okay. So when we're using or when we're running um, NMR spectroscopy, what we've got to do is we've got to use a reference. Okay. So like anything in science, we've got to measure it against something. Okay. So in NMR, we're using a reference chemical called tetramethylsilane okay or tms and this chemical is used to measure when you'll see in a minute um, about chemical shift but we're going to measure chemical shift in an nmr spectrum so it's like a benchmark so nuclei okay remember we'll just go back to that previous like towards the start there so as nuclei absorb different amounts of energy at different frequencies, it's really difficult to measure the size or the magnitude of these without reference to something. So that something is going to be TMS, which is tetramethylsilane. And it looks a little bit like that. You can see it's probably the most symmetrical molecule you're ever going to see. Now to NMR, that means you have um, three carbons, as you can see here. So all three carbons are in the same environment, as are the hydrogens. All the hydrogens here are bonded to the same atom in the middle. So these are all in the same environment. So this will produce a peak, a nice strong peak, because we've got loads of different, um, you know, we've got loads of elements bonded to the same thing in the middle. It's also beneficial because it's inert. So you don't want this because you have to add this to your sample because it's your reference. You don't want this to react with your sample and also it's non-toxic and you can remove it quite easily at the end. So when you take your sample to be tested in NMR, you've got to dissolve it in this, which is your TMS, your tetramethylsilane, and that allows you to give you a reference. You'll see in the spectra later where TMS sits. So TMS... Um, the difference between the TMS peak that's produced by the substance and the, um, sorry, the TMS peak and the peak produced by the substance is called the chemical shift, okay? And it's given this little sigma value. Now, TMS is always given a sigma value of zero. So we calibrate the NMR machine to make sure that the TMS peak is always given a value of zero. And chemical shift is measured in parts per million or PPM, okay? So when we look at NMR spectrum, you'll often see a peak uh, at sigma equals zero. Okay, so your um, a value at zero means that this is your TMS, and you calibrate your NMR machine to make sure that is zero. A bit like what you would do with bathroom scales or kitchen scales, that you would have to press the um, zero button to make sure that it's at zero, and then you weigh your stuff on there. What you don't want to do is it's starting at, say, six grams or something, and then you add something in there, and it's always going to be six grams heavier. So that's really all it is. It's just we have to add a chemical to this to, to zero it. Okay. 
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the two different types of NMR spectroscopy. So the first one we're going to look at is carbon-13, which out of the two is probably the simplest one. So carbon-13, as we said, um, tells us about how many different carbon environments there are in the sample that's actually been tested. Okay, so remember we are looking at the environments before. So NMR is detecting how many carbon environments there are. So the peaks on a carbon-13 NMR spectrum tell us the number of different carbon environments. So let's have a look at an example. So here's a halogenoalkane or haloalkane. So we're bringing this back again. So this is um, chloromethane, as you can see there. Um, so you can see we're looking at the carbons here. So just ignore the hydrogens. We're only looking at carbons. And you can see that we have two different environments here. Okay, So we've got this one and we've got this one here. Okay, So let's have a look and see how they're, um, which peak is which. So you can see this one is that peak there. Now the reason why is that carbon is bonded directly to that chlorine. Chlorine is electronegative and it's going to be pulling electrons away from that carbon which is going to leave it less shielded to the external magnetic field. So because it's less shielded that means it's going to shift further up that spectrum and you can see there that this is shifted quite high up there. Okay. Now the other carbon there we are. So the carbon, this is the one in green, is shifted a little bit less high up because it's further away from that chlorine. So it's not been influenced by that chlorine as much because it's a little bit further away. So the chemical shift is lower as a consequence. Now you'll see there's a little peak at zero. So can you guess what that is? Well, that one is your TMS. So that's your tetramethylsilane. That's your reference chemical. So anything at zero is TMS. So just make sure you're aware of that. Okay. So carbon-13 spectroscopy tells us, like I say, how many different carbon environments there are in the sample being tested. But what we've got to be looking at as well is cyclic compounds, not just your linear ones, which are a little bit easier to detect. Now, when you're looking at cyclic compounds, what you've got to do is look for symmetry. Okay, So you're looking for how many carbons are in the same environment as each other. So let's have a look here. So there's your cyclic compound there. So this is... a uh, um, this one is 1,3-dichlorocyclohexane, okay, bit of a, a long one there. So what we're looking for is a line of symmetry. So your line of symmetry is here, there, okay, straight down the middle. So what we'll see is you can see, you might have seen them already, is you've got four carbon environments here using this line of symmetry to help us. So we've got one which is on the end here, that's that one. So that one is bonded to um, a carbon and a chlorine, so if you look here, that's bonded to a carbon chlorine. It's also bonded to a carbon chlorine on this side. Um, if we go further around, this is bonded to carbon chlorine and a CH2. And likewise on this side is bonded to the same thing. And likewise that's bonded to the middle carbon there. So that one is one environment. The next two are these ones. So these are both bonded to a chlorine, which are subsequently both bonded to that middle carbon circled in green. And they are then bonded on the other side to two CH2s and a CH. So these are identical. They're in the identical environment. Okay, let's keep going. So we've got the purple ones here. So that's the next peak down. So that peak is shifted a little bit less because it's further away from them electronegative chlorines. And finally, the last one is the one at the end here in orange. So that one comes out at a peak of about 20 okay so you can see we're looking for all these different types of symmetry and you can see in that one um and we're looking for um we're looking for the different environments that these carbons are in and again your tms is the one at the end there so that's at the end of that peak there okay so you can see it's you, it's practice really with this because it can be tricky especially your cyclic ones it's just trying to get as much practice in as you possibly can okay so Continuing on with carbon-13, so they have, as you've seen on them graphs there, they have shift values, okay? Um, and with them shift values, you can actually identify what environment they're in. Now, you will be given a data sheet with all, of this, uh, with all of this information on. So you're provided with this, like the one on the left. It might not be exactly the same, but it'd be fairly similar. And you can see that all the carbons that are highlighted um, all the carbons that are highlighted in red here actually symbolize the uh, carbon that we're looking at. So, for example, the carbon that's causing the peak is this carbon, which is bonded to, directly bonded to a 
double bond oxygen and then to a C, so it's directly bonded to that. Now what we can do with our spectrum is we can match up the positions of the peaks in our spectrum um, to what they could be in here and we can help to identify you know, what potential functional groups we have in our, um, in our compound. Now a word of warning, there are some issues and we've got a peak at 190 for example, so a peak at 190 and um, would suggest a carbonyl group. However, we can't be sure if this is an aldehyde or ketone, so there is some flaws with it, um, and there are overlaps too. So a peak at 60 could be an amine, it could be an alcohol, it could be an ester, and it could be an ether. So there is quite a bit of overlap with some of these peaks, so we can't really be looking at this and being absolutely certain um, unless, it's, unless the number that you've got fits exclusively into one of these groups. So... Let's have a look at an example. So a chemical has the formula C3H8O and its spectrum is shown below. And so we've got to write its displayed formula. So the first thing I would do in this case, they've given us the, um, the molecular formula here, which is C3H8O. Okay, so they've given us that. So what I think we should do is draw down all of our possible isomers. So anything that has that molecular formula, as we can see there. So here they are. So there's our three different isomers for this. Once you've got your isomers, it's really easy then to try and match it up with the spectrum. So we can see here straight away that there are three peaks in this spectrum. So this is telling us we must have three different carbon environments in this, in this, spectr in this spectrum here. So this rules out straight away propantuol as this only has, as this only has two. Okay, so that one's only got two environments where the other ones have three. So immediately, propantuol is ruled out here. So then we continue. So you can see we have two peaks at 65 and 75, and this suggests that two carbons are bonded to an electronegative element. And so this fits the structure of an ether rather than propan 1 all where we'd only see one peak in this area. So what we're doing is we're using that data that we'd seen on the previous slide there, um, using that information to try and work out what functional groups we have here. So in this case, um, you know, they're looking at the data. If you've got your data sheet in front of you, it's going to be the ether that's the likely one um, that this spectrum is rather than the alcohol. So use that data um, to try and identify functional groups. This is the type of thing they'll be expecting you to do. So just make sure you're familiar with it. Again, it's all about practice with NMR because it's very difficult to pick that up. Um, you know, I remember doing these at, when I was at uni, which is many years ago, um, when I was at university, um, and uh, analyzing spectra. Um, it used to take ages. It used to take, some of them were really quick. Some of them took a long time. I, I did it like as if there were crosswords. I had a few of these to to analyze, you know, every week from, from your uh, stuff, um, chemicals that you made, which often didn't go right, but never mind. Um, so anyway, you just need to familiarize yourself. That's what I'm saying. So make sure you're practice, practice, practice. Keep going with it. Okay. So we've looked at carbon-13 NMR. So now we're going to look at proton NMR, which is hydrogen. Um, so proton NMR. Now, just like carbon-13, proton NMR also tells us how many um, environments there are except we're looking at hydrogen environments however proton NMR has an extra added bonus is that it can actually tell us how many hydrogens there are in each sample okay so it's telling us a lot more information proton NMR tells a lot more information than carbon-13 NMR and with more information comes an extra layer of complexity so I'm going to try and explain this again as best as I can so you understand it I think this is going to be the trickiest one is proton NMR so the peaks on an NMR spectrum so proton NMR tells us the number of different hydrogen environments so just like the number of peaks on a carbon NMR tells us the number of carbon environments so you can see here we've got um, ethanoic acid. So this is our organic molecule, and we've got our proton NMR spectrum there on the left. Okay, so the numbers above the peaks, and we'll look at a little bit more detail in this, but the numbers above the peaks tell us the areas under the peaks, and what this allows us to do is tell us about the relative number of hydrogens in each environment. These can be decimals; they don't have to be whole numbers. 
Um, but they're basically telling us how many the relative ratio of the number of hydrogens in each environment. And the reason why we do this is it's really difficult to measure the area of one of these peaks under here. So thankfully, NMR machines actually put in what we call this red line, which is called an integration trace, which we'll look at in a bit more detail later. Um, and they put numbers at the top, and the numbers tell us the um, relative number of hydrogens in each of these environments. That could be one to three. Okay, so let's have a look and um, break this spectrum down. So you can see here we've got a hydrogen there on the OH, and that's that's the one with one, and this one's got three. There we are. So we've got two different hydrogen environments there, as you can see. So we've got two peaks, but one of the peaks has got three, as you can see, and one of them has got a one on there, which is the one in red. So you can see we have two hydrogen environments, so two different peaks are formed. And obviously the one at zero is your TMS, okay? No difference here, whether it's carbon-13 or proton NMR, you always have TMS peak at the end there. So the peak at the left has a value of one, um, and this, and the one on the right has a value of three. So it means what we've got is a three to one ratio. So this quite easily means you could have three hydrogens and one hydrogen. That's quite, that's probably a really good start. And if you say a three to one, you say, right, these hydrogens here, I've got three of these hydrogens in this environment, and I've got one hydrogen over here in this environment. Now you notice this has shifted well over to the left, because this is bonded directly to an oxygen, as you can see on there, whereas these ones here are not shifted as much, because they're well away from these electronegative oxygens. Okay, so like I say, we talked about the integration trace as well. Um, all that does is NMR puts a line on there, which allows us to work out um, the surface area of the peaks, but we'll look at this in a little bit more detail um, later on. Okay, so just like with carbon-13 NMR, you get data for proton NMR as well. It might not be exactly the same as this, but it's going to be something similar. Um, now you can see here that the numbers, the chemical shift values are lower for proton NMR than it is for carbon-13 NMR. And you can see again, I've highlighted all the hydrogens in here, in here. On your data sheet, they may be just put in bold. In this case, they are actually put in red. So the hydrogens marked in red are actually causing the shift. Okay, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail um, later on when we're using this data, um, when we're doing the joint, the joint analysis. But for the time being, um, we're going to look at just the single analysis here, which is just looking at the NMR spectrum of the chemical that we'd seen before. Now you can see, remember we had the two peaks, we had a three and a one here. So the peak at 11.7, so that's right up here, is definitely suggesting a carboxylic acid. So you can see here, the hydrogen that's causing um, that shift is the hydrogen there. That's the one that's bonded to the oxygen. And obviously the one at just over two, so 2.1 here, um, is caused by a hydrogen there, this hydrogen, which is bonded to that C double bond O, which is true because obviously that's it there. So it's this R group here is obviously representing this carbon, uh, this hydrogen here. We've got three hydrogens around there because that's telling us we've got a, a, a value of three. Okay, so let's carry on. So that's fine. So nothing too dissimilar there from carbon-13. But NMR comes with this extra layer of complexity, like I say, and the peaks in proton NMR can actually be split into smaller peaks now this is really powerful because actually what we can do with these split peaks is we can actually determine structure of our molecule so it's not just a case of what functional groups are in there and um, how many hydrogens there are in the environment we can actually see um, and look at structure so peaks that are split into so peaks that split into smaller peaks are known as a splitting pattern okay so the number of smaller peaks corresponds to the number of hydrogen atoms on the adjacent carbon plus one and this is known as spin spin coupling okay or an n plus one rule so this is a bit like me and um and let's say i'm influenced by what's happening next door either side of me okay so um a bit like nmr you've got a hydrogen and it's influenced by the number of hydrogens either side Okay, so um, the difference is that peak is split uh, and follows an n plus one rule. So let's have a look at what we mean when we say n plus one. So for example, a singlet peak, okay, means that we have no hydrogens on a neighboring carbon. Okay, so we have none at all. A doublet peak um, means that we have one hydrogen on a neighboring carbon. So if we've got a hydrogen and 
that hydrogen is bonded to a carbon, which it will be, and that is then bonded to um, another carbon with one hydrogen on, then we get a doublet peak. Okay, a triplet peak means we've got two hydrogens on a neighbouring carbon, and a quartet means we've got three hydrogens on a neighbouring carbon. <coughs> so, so you can see this is called an N plus 1 rule, because we have the number of, say it's got one hydrogen, so plus 1 is a doublet peak. But I think it's more, I think you'll get this a little bit more when we look at an example. So you can see here that we've got a spectrum here of our molecules. So we've got ethanol. Here's our alcohol uh, alcohol here. And we have the spectrum of the alcohol. Now what I've done is I've put the groups on here just so it's a little bit easier to see. The OH, the CH2 and the CH3 um, that's on here. And you can see that these peaks have been split into smaller peaks as you can see there. So let's have a look at the first one which is this hydrogen here. So the hydrogen on OH is bonded to an oxygen. This is not a carbon. So um, the neighboring hydrogens is zero. We don't have any neighboring hydrogens on this. So remember, it's got to be a carbon. This hydrogen has got to be bonded to a carbon, which is then bonded to a carbon when you look at the number of hydrogens. But in this case, um, there isn't any carbon here. So it's zero plus one is one. It's a singlet. And in fact, you'd see that is a single peak. It's not split. Okay, it's a single peak showing OH. Okay, so let's have a look at another one. So these two here, so the hydrogens on the CH2 are adjacent to one carbon. Okay, there it is there. Okay, and that has three hydrogens on it. So we do the N plus one rule. So number of hydrogens is three, plus one is four. So three plus one is four. So this would be a quartet. And in fact, this CH2, as you can see there, this peak is split into four because this is, as an integration of two, there's two hydrogens itself, but is next door to three other hydrogens, so therefore it's split into four. The peak itself is split into four, so it's a quartet. And then finally, if we look at the green ones here, so there we are. So these hydrogens, we've got three hydrogens here. They're adjacent to a carbon, one carbon that has two hydrogens on it. So we apply the N plus one rule, so two plus one is three, and in fact, you see this CH3 here is then split into three peaks. So you can see you've got one, two, three peaks that's split there. Okay, so that's a triplet. So you can see this splitting pattern. You can see what causes this splitting pattern. Basically tells us information about what's next door to that hydrogen or carbon. Okay, so like I say, we looked at integration traces a little bit before. So we're just going to bring them back in a little bit because then what we're going to start and do now is pool splitting patterns together, pool the integration traces together and try and analyze a spectrum. But I just want to talk about integration a little bit more before we do that. So integration traces, like I said, um, shows the area under the peak a lot more clearly. It's really difficult to work out the area under a peak. So integration traces allow us to do that. And it shows us the hydrogen ratio in a molecule. So like I say, it's really difficult to work out that area, it's particularly when the peaks are split. So you have split peaks. Okay. So an integration trace is used um, and the height ratio of the trace corresponds to the air, to the area ratio. So in practice, we use a ruler to measure these vertical parts. We write down the lengths and we use the numbers to come up with a ratio. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Right. I've done a lot of talking. Um, okay. So in this spectrum, it's a big topic. So in this spectrum, we can see we've got an integration trace and it shows a one to one and a half to one and a half ratio. Okay. Now, if we round this up to get whole numbers, we get a two to three to three ratio. So you can see here, we grab a ruler and we measure the height of that. We measure the height of that and we measure the height of that. And we basically convert that into a whole number ratio. So it's about the height is the same is, is linked or proportional to the area under this split peak here. Okay, so this tells us here that we have three different hydrogen environments because we've got three different peaks, as you can see. One of them has got two hydrogens and the other two has got three hydrogens in its environment, in the same environment. So this is telling us the number of environments, it's telling us how many hydrogens are in that environment and the splitting pattern is telling us what's next door to them hydrogens and how many hydrogens they have. So we're starting to get a really good image of the structure here. Okay, so let's have a look at an example here. And we're going to bring all of these things together. So integration trace, splitting patterns, shift, etc. And we're going to predict the structure 
of the compound um, using the data table from this proton NMR spectrum with a molecular formula of C4H8O2. Okay, so you need to have your data, data table handy. Obviously, the one previously I'm going to use for this example. So here's our spectrum here. So the first thing is we need to note is there are three hydrogen environments here. We've got three different peaks. Okay, so they've got a ratio from our integration trace of two to three to three, which is likely to be, but not certain, likely to be one CH2 and two CH3 molecules with, um, within this molecule it's fine to speculate okay it's fine to kind of get your teeth into something and i would always start with the number of hydrogen environments first and then look at the integration trace to try and work out what type of groups we may have here okay so using the table that we'd seen before the peak at 4.1 has a value of 2 this suggests it's a ch2 as we said and using the data table we can actually come up with this structure here so we can see here that we've got a ch and um, we've got a ch2 here so the hydrogen responsibility is bonded to the carbon that's bonded to an oxygen and a c double bond o. this is looking like an ester okay so straight away just from that peak we can we can confirm that this must be an ester because that's an ester group okay so it's just about what's here and what's here you know so trying to break that down a little bit so that's the first thing okay so the splitting pattern is a quartet so that's this one here so this is suggesting that this ch2 is next door to a carbon with three hydrogens that could be a ch3 so it's it gives us a little bit of information here so we're saying right it could be a ch3 okay so let's look at the next peak this has a peak of 2.1 so this is this big single peak here okay this is a value of three it suggests that itself is a ch3 group okay and using the data table of a shift of two it tells us or 2.1 it tells us that this could be this here so we have a ch3 group so we've got one hydrogen there it's probably likely to be a hydrogen and a hydrogen there but this ch3 group is directly bonded to a c double bond o okay this actually fits quite nicely with this r group here so maybe this ch3 could fit here this bit now one of the key things with nmr don't want you to get confused with this is when we draw this structure here and we draw this one here what we're not saying we're absolutely not saying that we have this and this in our molecule okay we don't have this and this bonded together what this is saying is it's a bit like seeing um uh it's a bit like seeing a, a picture for example okay so what we're going to do is we're going to i'm going to show you a little bit of the picture and i'm going to cover it up and then I'm going to reveal a different bit of the picture of the same picture. I'm going to reveal a different part and then I'm going to cover it up and then I'm going to reveal a different bit and then I'm going to cover it up. So what you're doing in your head is you're trying to visualize what this image could be by piecing together the individual bits that you've seen. NMR is exactly the same. OK, so what we're looking at is we're saying, right, we've got this structure here. That's a good base, really, to, to be honest. Uh, we have this CH3 that's bonded to a carbonyl, but this carbonyl is basically that there it's exactly the same this is just telling us that this is next to a c double bond or so effectively you can put our ch3 on the end there we're just showing little bits of this okay so the splitting pattern is a singlet and this suggests that this ch3 is next to a carbon with no hydrogens at all and actually this fits perfectly well because it's bonded next door to a c double bond or so this is telling us that there's definitely nothing else bonded here it's just this on its own next to that okay so that works well so that definitely is there okay right let's carry on so let's look at this peak at 1.2 it has a value of three which suggests this is a CH3 using the data table and um, this suggests that the structure is an RCH3 structure um, it's a triplet as well triplet peak which means that this is next door to a carbon with two hydrogens likely to be a CH2 so it's got three hydrogens itself but is next door to something with a CH2 well we've already identified a CH2 here that's this bit here and we've already identified that so maybe this ch3 could be bonded to the end here and form in your full molecule so let's have a look let's confirm it so there it is there and let's draw our circles so there's your ch3 and there's your ch2 which has got your quartet because next to the ch3 and that ch3 is a triplet because next door to the ch2 once you've drawn your structure 
always go back, revert it back to the original spectrum, just to make sure it fits. Okay, we're going to look at um, we're going to look at um, combined spectroscopy later. Um, so we're going to have another bit of practice at this using other types of spectroscopy as well. Okay, so another type um, is elemental analysis. So this is another type of um, spectroscopy. It's a bit of a funny bit. It's kind of just been kind of sandwiched between mass spec and NMR, but never mind. There's not much you need to know on this whatsoever. Um, but elemental analysis is just a method in which we can determine the structure of a sample that's that's under test. Um, so it you won't see one of these if you've been to college or of school. You won't have one of these in school. They're very expensive. So they're preserved for university. Um, but um, elemental analysis, you can see the picture there, it helps us to determine the percentage composition or mass of elements that make up that compound. Now this can be really useful if we know the percentages, then we can actually work out the empirical formula and hence the molecular formula. So elemental analysis is really mainly used for that. So like I say, so if we know the molecular formula, we can work out the structure of the compound um, and actually the data produced from elemental analysis helps us to determine this empirical and molecular formula of the compound. So you might have seen, you might see this as examples of, for example, it might say you've got 20% oxygen, um, uh, you might have 60% um, carbon, uh, and then you might have 30% um, hydrogen. So they might give you a percentage like that, and you have to work out the empirical formula. So um, Really, all you need to be aware of is that elemental analysis is the name of the bit of equipment that is used to determine the percentage composition of elements. Okay. Okay, so just coming to the last run of this video, and this is where we're going to be looking at combined techniques. So we're going to take everything we know about um, uh, modern analytical techniques and we're going to combine them to work out an unknown. So we use all these techniques to work out an unknown substance and the skill really is putting all of this together and trying to come up with uh, the name of a, of a molecule. This would be very common in your exam, so be prepared. So here we've got three spectra of an unknown organic compound, and we're going to identify this compound by using the spectra that we have here. So we've got proton NMR on the left here, as you can see there. We've got infrared here, and we've got mass spectrometry, which is MS down here. So we're going to use all three to basically identify, to work out what the compound is. Yes, I know it's a bit strange that all you're seeing is just lines and lines and lines and we're actually going to do something with this. So that's all the information I'm going to give you. So let's have a look. We're going to start with, let's start with the mass spectrum first, shall we? So remember the mass spectrum is really useful because it tells us the molecular mass of our compound. So that narrows it down quite well. So this has got a mass of 58. Whatever this compound is, has a mass of 58. It also, we've got a fragment peak at 29. Now, this could be a C2H5 or it could be a CHO. So, we've got a little bit of information there. So, what we can deduce just from this is that our mystery molecule has a mass of 58, molecular mass, and it may have a CHO group in it, okay? So, it may have one of them. So, we need more information, though, to confirm exactly what it is, but just keep that in your mind. Okay, so let's look at the infrared spectrum. So infrared is really good at detecting functional groups here, so we can confirm this. So you can see we've got a peak at 1750, and you'll get data for infrared as well. And this is likely to be caused by a carbonyl group, so a C double bond or. So actually, infrared has confirmed that we do have a C double bond or. However, um, we can deduce that we either have an aldehyde, a ketone, an ester, an acid chloride, or an acid anhydride. So we have a few different possibilities here. It can't be a carboxylic acid, though, um, as the peak doesn't sit between the 2,500 to 3,300 towards the top end. Um, and it can't be an amide either, because there isn't a peak at 3,300 or 3,500. So we've kind of eliminated that, and infrared has confirmed there is a carbonyl group in there. And so we need a lot more information, though, to confirm what our molecule is. We're getting a little bit of information. So in steps in NMR, and we're going to look at proton NMR to try and identify this. So the first thing we should note here is that we have three different hydrogen environments involved in this molecule. So this peak here um, at 9.5 is due to the CHO group, which again confirms in this spectrum that we do have a um, carbonyl group somewhere in our molecule. 
and we have these two here these are due to chx groups so these are also confirmed via infrared so we know that you know there are um alkyl groups in there so ch groups and there's no other functional group in there so we know there's only one functional group because infrared has told us that so the peak at one so this is this early peak here this one here has an integration of three so it means we've got three hydrogen environments here probably going to be a ch3 okay it's a triplet so this ch3 is going to be next door to a ch2 so, or something with two a carbon with two hydrogen environments which is likely to be a ch2 okay so the peak at 2.5 which is this peak here has an integration of two as you can see on there so itself has two hydrogens it's a pentet so it's split in five different ways which means it's adjacent to carbons with four hydrogens so that doesn't mean you might think well hang on hang on you've got a carbon you can't have four hydrogens around the carbon this remember we're looking what's left and right so you might have two carbons um with two hydrogens each and that means it's got four so we're not just looking at one carbon we're looking at both sides okay so this is likely to be near a ch3 and the cho group because we know there's a cho group in there as well um identified obviously that as 9.5 and itself is a triplet of course this this 9.5 one so this is suggesting that it's next door to a ch2 so that's kind of um this is the kind of information that we're getting from that okay so now what we need to do is we've got all the information that we need we need to actually do something with this we need to put it all together to try and come up with this compound you might have got an idea in your head what it might be so the mass spectrometer tells us that the substance has a molecular mass of 58. Okay. The infrared spectrum confirms there's a carbonyl group in there. However, there were no other peaks to suggest any other functional group. So we know that this molecule will only have this carbonyl group. It doesn't have anything else. The NMR confirms that the carbonyl group is part of an aldehyde group. So we know it must be an aldehyde. An NMR also confirms a CH2 and a CH3 group, uh, which when supported with the mass spectra information that the molecule is a mass of 58, we can then come up with our mystery molecule, which is actually this. So it's propanal. Okay. So as with anything, go back, use that particularly with NMR, it's really powerful. Go back and make sure that your molecule matches your NMR spectrum. Um, you know, just to make sure you've got it right. A lot of marks up for grabs here, so well worth the effort of practicing this because, um, you know, you can virtually guarantee that this or something along the lines of this will come up in the exam. So just be prepared for it. Okay, and that is it. So that's everything for uh, modern analytical techniques um, for the polymers and life topics, the PL topic for salters. Um, like I say, there's a full range of videos for all the uh, all the topics for salters for year one and year two on Alloy Chemistry YouTube channel. I've also got some whiteboard tutorials on there as well for general information. Um, it's all for free. All I ask is you please subscribe. That would be a massive, massive help um, and share the videos. Um, and also, um, like I say, if you do want to purchase these, you really good value for money, click on the link in the description box and you'll be able to get a hold of them there. Um, right, that is it. I'm going to get a glass of water because I've talked for a long time. All right, okay, bye-bye.